Friends, my name is Daniel. Uh, I come from Southwestern, uh, which is in South Kansas. Uh, and it is my joy and my privilege to be with you today to share about one of my greatest passions, and that is a passion for making pottery. Now, uh, pots are, well, so potters are in the business of uh, creating, put it that way. We begin with something as simple as a piece of unformed clay. Now, to some people, they may see this and just think that it's a piece of dirt. And in fact, that is what it uh, is. But to the potter, he sees not only uh, dirt, but he sees what he wants to make out of it. He sees the beautiful pot that he's going to create out of it. Now, I've been making pots for about five years now. Uh, and I don't think that qualifies me to say that I'm a master at the uh, craft just yet. But what I've found as I've continued to make pots is that the, um, the image of having a piece of clay on the wheel, I think, is one of the most powerful symbols that we can have to understand how God forms us and shapes us. You know, when the potter brings the clay to the wheel, he makes a pot with a purpose. Now, pots, they, they don't all have the exact same uh, purpose. Some pots are made just to be looked at, and some pots like bowls, mugs, and pitchers are made to be used in everyday life. But no matter what the purpose of the pot is, it is the uh, task of the potter to take something that is as uh, is as formless as a piece of clay and make it into something that is beautiful, something that is purposeful and something that is full of life. And, you know, one of the things that we remember as one of the most foundational truths of our faith is that we, too, are made by the hands of a master potter. You know, I uh, am reminded of Genesis chapter 2, where we see God making the first uh, human beings out of the dust of the ground. He uh, forms them and makes them and calls them beautiful and good creations. And so we too remember that we are made in the, in the image of God. But one of the things that I want to propose to you today among a couple of, of other things is that perhaps we are not creations that are complete. Perhaps we are not like a piece of pottery that has gone through the kiln and has been brought to its completed um, place. Perhaps we are more like this piece of unformed clay, that we are ready to come to the wheel to, to, to offer ourselves to God as a piece of soft clay that is ready to embark on a process of being transformed by grace, one phase at a time. And, and I, I wonder, like, is, is this the purpose that we have gathered here for? We've all come here to Atlanta to next 2016, perhaps to offer ourselves to God, to say, God, would you mold me and shape me? Would you make me into something that is beautiful? And it is in this spirit that I think we come to worship today. And so in that um, mindset, I invite you to join me as we worship the God who has not only created us today, but the God who continues to form us and make us by his wonderful and transforming grace. So I invite you now in a time of worship.
Will you pray with me? God, you're so good. So, so good. Thank you for bringing us all here. Thank you for the gifts you have given us. Thank you for making us new. No matter what we've gone through, what we go through, you are always with us. You are always making us beautiful. And you are beautiful to us. Just remember that. Remember how beautiful you are, God, and help us remember how beautiful we are in your image. Amen.
if you're anything like me, perhaps you have found that sometimes it's not always easy or simple to offer the clay of your heart to God with the intention to be molded and shaped. You know, one of the very first things that you learn when you're uh, beginning to throw on the potter's wheel is that there's a great difference between soft and hard clay. Uh, soft clay, of course, is the material that you want to uh, make pots out of. It's much uh, easier to make things out of. It's more responsive to the potter's touch, and it doesn't take a lot of um, effort to have it do what you want it to do. It's really quite nice, actually. Whereas hard clay is naturally much more difficult. You know, it's rougher, it's uh, tougher, it's, it's almost as if it's resisting the hand of the potter, fighting back. And as, as I've uh, worked with hard clay over, you know, time, I sometimes feel that it's, it's as if the hard clay doesn't trust me to make it into something beautiful. It doesn't trust that I, as the potter, can make it into something beautiful and useful. And I wonder if the hard clay has internalized this narrative that goes something like this. Although once you might have been soft, although once you might have been able to be made into a beautiful pot, because you are now hard, because you are now dry, you're no longer of any use too far gone, too dry, too hard, not able to be used by the potter. And as it believes that narrative, as it internalizes that idea, it only becomes harder and drier as it truly comes to believe that it could never be of any use. And friends, I wonder today what are the narratives that tempt to keep the clay of our hearts dry? I think there are so many voices in our uh, world that want to tell us that we will never be good enough. There are so many of these. There is the sound of shame, guilt, despair. We might have regret for things that we have done in the past or things that we have left undone. There might have been something in our past that seems to never cease from haunting us. Or perhaps we've been told one too many times that the future that we dream will never come to be. These voices are loud, and I have heard them many, many times. And they tempt us to believe that even if we were to offer the clay of our hearts to God, yearning that he would mold us and make us into the beautiful things that he has intended for us, that God would not be able to do it. And in the face of such potential despair, I think it's important to remember today that even the hardest of clay does not need to always remain hard. For even the driest piece of clay is always, always able to be reworked, reformed, and rehydrated to the point that it is again usable to be put on the wheel and made into a pot. All it takes is the application of water. And I, I can't help but think about our baptismal uh, covenant where we remember that it has been through the waters that God has saved his people, that he has reached out in grace and redeemed throughout history. We remember that when there was nothing but chaos, God swept across the dark waters to bring forth light. We remember that when the nation of uh, Israel was in captivity, it was through the waters of the Red Sea that God delivered them to the Promised Land. And we also remember that in the fullness of time, that 
Jesus himself, the Son of God, was nurtured in the water of the womb, that we may know once and for all that the God of creation is always with us. And in the, the same way that adding water to a pot makes it capable of being formed and shaped again, I think that when we remember the waters of our baptism, that we remember a narrative that has the power to speak grace and truth into the darkest, most broken, most dried parts of our soul. And that narrative breaks the power of those other ones that want to tell us that no matter what we do, no matter how much we try, no matter how much we lean into the grace of God, it'll never be enough. For in our baptisms, we remember that God has reached out to us claimed us, called us his beloved sons and daughters. And so friends, know today that clay is never too far gone, and so never are we too far gone. To be used by the master potter, to be made into the beautiful things that he has planned for us. So no matter how you come to the Lord today, no matter what brokenness, um, ails you, or what narrative tempts to keep you captive to fear. Know today that it is the glory of the God we serve, that he is not only willing, but able to take those hard, dry parts of our hearts and to heal them with the tender touch of his mercy. And when we remember who we are and whose we are in the water of our baptism, I think we will find that the clay of our hearts becomes softer and softer as we place our trust in the God who has made us and the God who has promised to heal us and redeem us and then transform us from hard, broken pieces of clay into beautiful creations. May that be where our hope is found, not in our abilities, but in the God who has reached out to us in love.
one of my uh, one of my favorite authors, and probably one of the uh, one of the voices that has been most influential in my spiritual formation is Henry Nouwen. And if you haven't heard of uh, Henry Nouwen, he wrote during the 20th century, and he uh, writes a book called In the Name of Jesus. And in that book, he writes a lot about Christian identity, and particularly this, this idea that the most foundational narrative that we as Christians can speak over our lives is that before anything else, before we go out and do anything in the world, our primary identity is that we are beloved children of God. He actually writes in one place that if we keep this in mind, if we can keep in mind that we are the beloved, not because of anything that we can do, but only because of Christ's love for us, if we keep that in mind, we can experience great amounts of success as well as great amounts of failure without forgetting who we are, for who we are, are the beloved. And you know, friends, events like Next really excite me. It really excites me to be here because events like Next carve out space for young people like you and me to dream, imagine, to explore and discern where God is calling us to go and what it looks like to live that out in our world. And I can't think of a much more beautiful task than doing that good work in community. But if I was being honest with you, I, I would say that I think we are headed for danger if we go about that good work without first being radically rooted in knowing who we are. For if we don't know who we are and we go out into the world to try to do what God has called us to do, I, I fear that we will get caught up in the narratives of the world. For the truth is we live in a world that constantly invites us to prove our worth, to prove how good and worthy we are by the work that we can produce. It invites us to prove that we are worthy of love by showing that we can earn it. And yet the narrative that God has offered us in our baptism is a narrative that challenges us not to be found in the work that we do, not in the work of our hands, but to be found only in the unmerited love of Christ. And to know that there is nothing that we could do to make us, to make us either earn or to be found unworthy of such a love. And I think this, this has to be the foundation. This has to be the place where we understand our calling. This has to be the deep well which our vocation springs forth from. It's not easy to internalize a narrative. I've, I've been trying to do it for a couple years now. It's hard when the things that you feel can hold you back seem to be so prevalent and yet as we internalize the narrative that we find in our baptisms, I think again we find our clay of our hearts begins to soften, begins to be transformed as we put our trust in God, not in ourselves. And so, friends, my encouragement to you today is that we would, in fact, dream, go, and do. Go and do something amazing, incredible, new, and authentic to you to make a world-changing difference for the kingdom of God. But go and do it knowing first who you are. And trusting with a sincere confidence in the hands of our Creator God who is faithful to mold us and make us. And when we offer the clay of our hearts, he will never say that you are too far gone, but that he will indeed shape you, mold you, transform you by his overwhelming grace into something that is beautiful, purposeful, full of life.
friends, may this be so in our narratives, this day and every day. Amen.